Today is a very exciting day. It's Seeking Excellence History, probably the most fun in-person podcast we've oh ever had to do. Isabel, thank you for joining me today. Nathan, I'm so excited to be back on the pod. So you've got your new book out. And how's, how's it been? You know, oh I know life is crazy post book launch, I'm sure. This has been maybe the busiest week of my whole life. My book, The End of the Alphabet, came out a week ago today. And I've been in five states since it came out. We're going all over the country by the time April is over. So it's just like absolutely a whirlwind of activity. But the response has been so phenomenal. Yeah. And we almost immediately hit number one on the Amazon bestseller list, for that, yeah. Glory, which was crazy. And we're hoping for some other bestseller list being published this week, although they'll probably leave us off because you know how the media works these days. But it's just really cool to know that there are so many people out there who feel like they were voiceless up until this point from our generation that people didn't understand who we were and what our values were. And one of the major reasons I decided to write this book was stemming from frustration that I was kind of this token voice for Generation Z and media and politics and culture. And everyone older than us kept trying to tell me our generation is destroying America. Yeah. And that just wasn't what I was seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's 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 kind of crazy. And, and something for me that I think until you really pointed it out, like I didn't realize how unfair, you know, I don't think that I'm overly critical. Sometimes I feel like as the millennials, we can just kind of be like the older sibling, you know, pointing out like Gen Z, like everything's just kind of different. So you just kind of make fun of it. And it goes back and forth, I think between Gen Z and millennials. But I think, yeah, I was like, man, people are really, really hard on that generation. And, and I think the, I can't remember which chapter it was, but there's a, a point in there where you talk about marriage specifically that really got me thinking about how, and I, I always blame a lot of times the issues of society on the boomers. Mm -hmm. I think in the church, <laughs> in society, like a lot of the problems that we have, I think come from that generation and yeah. you see it kind of flowing into the next several generations. But it's amazing to me how our parents, our grandparents' generation, our great-grandparents' generation, they raise the kids and then blame the kids for the way that they are. That's exactly correct. I could not have said that better myself. And so it's so weird to me that I keep being told by people who have Generation Z kids largely or grandkids you are the ones who got us in this horrible space. You are the ones normalizing the LGBTQ plus community. You guys are normalizing the death of family and the death of marriage. You yep. guys are making all of this mainstream in culture. And I just have to turn around and ask these people who raised us, like who built the world that we're growing Literally. up in right now? Because most of Generation Z is still a child, is still teenagers. When we yep. talk about Gen Z, we're talking about those of us born in 1997, that's me, I'm the oldest, all the way down to 2012. So 12, 13 year olds through 27 year olds. Those are kids, mostly teenagers who are still trying to figure out their way in the world and what their generational stamp on the world is going to be. It's physically impossible for us to have created and ideated all of these insane ideas that are now mainstream American culture. Right. Yeah, it's so sad to me because, yeah, you basically create all these things. You think about no fault divorce, you know, gay marriage, abortion, obviously just getting out of control. And yeah, we, let's create all of these circumstances in this environment. <laughs> and raise children poorly for the most part, because yeah. I'm sure the percentages of, of Gen Z, I would, I would imagine that higher than any you know generation before them born to single parents, you know, or single mothers and all that kind of stuff. So you have just this environment set up to fail but expecting you to like save the world. Yeah, exactly. And then blaming us when we haven't yet in the process, which is really crazy. But what really is inspiring and encouraging to me doing all of the research for this book, and I've made several heads explode in the last week in the media telling them this, is that like any young generation who came before us, young people always want to do one thing, and that's rebel against the people who came before them. And I think in American history, we look at that through a lens of covering your body in tattoos and piercings and leather jacket yeah. punk rock bands and sticking it to the man, right? But now to be radically countercultural and to rebel against the people who came before you is to want to get married and reject this woke corporate culture we're living in. It's to eat real food and to yeah. quit your birth control and to delete your dating apps. And that's exactly what Generation Z is doing. There was a recent study that said 93% of our generation still wants to get married in a time that we have the lowest marriage rate in American history, which is astounding to me. 62% of us have already started our own businesses. And we very much believe that businesses can be a vehicle to change culture and to impact people for the better, not just 
to sell something or make a lot of money in the process. Right. Uh, we're eating real food and saying we want nothing to do with this lab grown meat crap or the synthetic chemicals and in, uh, in factories that are somehow marketed as healthier to us. Uh, the Washington Post just two days ago wrote maybe the most garbage piece of journalism I've ever seen freaking out that young women everywhere are quitting their oh, hormonal yeah, that. control <laughs> and how it's because of right wing influencers spreading yeah, misinformation. It's clearly my fault. Sorry. But really, they're just trying to gaslight you into thinking the side effects on the box are somehow a conspiracy, yeah. which is ridiculous. But you're watching this very radical, for lack of a better term, overheaval of society, overhaul of society from our generation rebelling against the authoritarian left and the secular left and saying, you know, we're looking around at culture and we're not happy. We're miserable. We're not successful. Everybody can't afford anything. Uh, we're not fulfilled or have purpose in our life because you tell us that the most important things in the world are ourselves and I'm not happy. I'm miserable. So what's out there that could be more than that? And how can we achieve that? Right. Yeah, it's powerful, man. And I think, you know, I want to go back to our first podcast episode we did together, which I think was maybe two years ago. That's so if crazy. If I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was the summer of, yeah, 2022 because I had just gotten married and I was working. I remember I was in my father-in-law's office for like a couple months in between oh, yes. before we moved into here. Yep. And so that's where I was. And I remember one of my, and I don't know how much you remember for that conversation, but my favorite thing that happened that day was I had no idea that you were Catholic. Mm -hmm. But what I think I've been able to see just in you and in, I think you being more outspoken about it and just being more proud that you're Catholic. And so I wanted to ask you a lot about, you know, how you think all, all the research and things that you've done, the way that you understand Gen Z, the problems in the way that we treat them, you know, really kind of get into that in the Catholic world. Mm. And how do we, you know, really evangelize Gen Z? How do we call them back? How do we, um, you know, bring them into the church? Not just the Gen Z Catholics, but also those who are Gen Z that were never were yeah. raised with no faith, because obviously, I think they have probably the highest percentage of that as well in potentially American history. But I first want to start with Tell us a little bit about your journey over the last couple of years. Am I am I reading it correctly? You Have are, you gone you deeper are. into you know Catholicism in your faith? And, oh my and gosh, kind I of have in the so much I could say about all of this, and it could take <laughs> ten hours, like a PhD dissertation. So it's going to be hard for me to limit myself uh, because I'm a talker. You know this, Nathan. But professionally, I'm, from here in Colorado, I, I grew up about thirty minutes from where you live. And was always born and raised Catholic, was baptized as an infant, went through all the sacraments, loved being Catholic all the way through high school. I went to Catholic high school here in Denver at Mullen High School, uh, which I've been told is a little more Catholic than Catholic these days, but praying for all of that. I loved it. It was such a huge part of my identity. I never, ever questioned, is this the right faith for me? Is this the right denomination for me? And when I went to college, had a bit of a different experience in the campus ministry group and uh, was very, very involved, as you know, with a lot of political activism that was happening on campus and really trying to facilitate ideological diversity on my college campus. Uh, that's really where God was calling me to be combined with studying biomedical sciences. So most yep. of my time in the classroom and late at night was in the library studying until two, three in the morning to make sure I could pass my tests in organic chemistry which I love being transparent about, I had to take three times. That is the worst class on the face of the planet. And if you're out there, it's okay to repeat organic chemistry. And so there was this huge love of the campus ministry group with a lot of the Catholic students on my college campus, but there was kind of this expectation. And frankly, it was said out loud by many of my friends that you were a bad Catholic. If you couldn't go to daily mass every single day, if you couldn't be in eight different Bible studies, if you didn't go every single Sunday to the free dinner that was provided, if you didn't sign up for every single retreat, your faith was not the most important thing in your life and you were a bad Catholic. And I was very frequently chastised by a lot of the people in my religious community because I was studying until three in the morning, pursuing a degree like biomedical sciences yeah. instead of liberal arts and something that could have been more, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but more uh, amenable to the schedule for the campus ministry group. I couldn't be in eight Bible studies because I was in 20 different clubs on campus and I was the student body vice president and I had a lot of things going on. And so it was a lot. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I was dating somebody who was a Protestant Christian and every once in a while we would go to church together on the weekends. And so I started exploring other denominations because I had never done that in my life. 
Uh, certainly never had been to Protestant church up until the time I went to college. And so it was a totally different atmosphere and really interesting just to experience from an anthropological perspective in some ways of, wow, this is so different. Why are they doing this and asking all of these questions? Uh, and so like many people, I think my Catholic faith wasn't the most important thing to me anymore because I had a really bad experience with other people trying to do the holier than thou thing and trying to make it about themselves instead of about the community and fostering mutual love for everybody. And that's really unfortunate, but I'm really glad I had that experience because throughout COVID, when I was bouncing around to several different states and everybody was just watching church on YouTube, which is a time I pray we never go back to. That was so horrifying. I just felt like something was so fundamentally missing from my life. Uh, my significant other at the time never wanted to go to church. It was like pulling teeth to try wow. to get this person to go to church and red flags started going off everywhere. Sick. This is not the person I'm supposed to end up with in my life. And that has to be the most important thing, not just for me, but in our relationship. And I started going back to mass in Phoenix at the time. Most of the churches were very cautious about COVID and that was mm -hmm very weird showing up to mass and they're like, don't touch anybody during the sign of peace. We're not doing half of communion. Everybody has to wear their mask the whole time. Yeah. Very weird. But even then when it was such a weird mass environment, I loved being back at mass. I loved the structure. I loved the tradition. And this all really came to a head for me uh, when I met my now fiance. He grew up in the Southern Baptist church. So a very different faith denomination than myself. For sure. But Early on, we started talking about God and faith and what we wanted out of that in our life. And uh, we had the chance about a year and a few months into our relationship to go to the Holy Land to visit Israel with our job then at the time, Turning Point USA. And we'd been going to mass together pretty consistently every Sunday for about two, three months before we went to Israel. So he was very familiar with the process. But as we went around this beautiful country, which if you ever get the chance, you have to go. It is the most earth shattering, life changing experience. We're going to Peter's house on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there's a Catholic church over it. We're on the Mount of the Beatitudes. And there's a Catholic church there. You go to the tomb of Jesus which is built inside of a Catholic church. The Garden of Gethsemane has a Catholic church there. And for me, it was this tie to not just the history of our faith of Catholicism, yeah. but of Christianity at large. And it reminded me of something my dad said all the time when I was kind of bouncing around between different churches when I was in college. He said, you know, I think you'll come back to Catholicism eventually because it's your heritage, not just your heritage in our family with us being Catholic, but it's your heritage as a Christian. Yeah. Like our heritage as believers is the Catholic church and nothing was more tangible and like physically able to be touched for me around that sentiment, like visiting Israel. Uh, so we had the chance to go to mass a few times there, including at the tomb of Jesus in the church of the Holy Sepulcher. And that set off a whole different cascade of thoughts for my fiance, who is now in RCIA. He's about to be confirmed in a couple of weeks. And I just fell so back in love with the Catholic <laughs> church to a way that I never, ever, ever thought possible or imagined. That's amazing. So I want to know, you know, now that you brought it up, what are your thoughts on the TLM? And mm -hmm. maybe we can get to some of that, like, there's an interesting mix in my opinion, and I'm sure you're you're obviously very familiar with like the red pill um slash uh I think there's there's some overlap with like the red pill movement and the super trads hmm. of the world. That's yeah. interesting yeah. to think about. I have not made a lot of friends the last couple of weeks because I did a live stream about the red pill thing. Um, I actually was reacting to Michael Knowles and Pearl Davis's conversation on his yes. live stream or his podcast. I watched it so a couple of weeks ago. I actually wanted to do, there was a specific part that I wanted to talk about as well, but I haven't done it yet. It was fascinating to Very. listen to because I could kind of see where both of them were have coming from. Have you talked with her? No, actually, I've never, I, Pearl and I have followed each other for years and we had something scheduled, but then the timing didn't work out last fall. And so would love to sit down with her because I think that would be an interesting conversation. I agree. But uh, I have noticed that the red pill manosphere alpha male community, which I think could include a lot of Pearl's content, but the Fresh and Fit podcast sure. and the Andrew Tates of the world, they're so intelligent in correctly diagnosing the problems in mm -hmm. society but they're prescribing a lot of the wrong solutions to how to fix those problems. So for example, right. they talk about really extremely high divorce rates and how for a lot of men that's been setting men up to financial failure and da, 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 which is objectively true. That is happening in society, but their solution to that is marriage is a horrible institution and we should never engage in that. And it sets men up always for failure. So the only way to be an alpha male or a high value man or whatever they want to call that mm -hmm. is to never get married, sleep with as they many women as possible and just throw caution to the wind. 
which ironically is exactly what the radical feminist community also tells women. So it's weird to me that it's like yeah. two sides of the same coin. Feminism tells women marriage is horrible for you. It sets women up to fail. It's going to hold your career back. It's going to hold your personal life back. The only way to be a strong girl boss woman is to never get married and sleep with as many people as possible. And so it's literally the exact same lingo. We're just calling it two different things and saying it's two ends of the political spectrum, but it's the exact same solutions that they're prescribing. Um, I don't know that I've really noticed a whole lot of overlap between the red pill and the ultra trad thing. But now that you say that, it's very interesting. And I will be diving into a lot of that. And I think ultimately, look, mass is mass, right? Whether you're saying it in a certain language, whether you're facing the altar or not. I, I love that people are tied back to the traditionalism and the heritage of the TLM. I think that speaks volumes to our constantly progressive society. The fact that we want to go backwards and be tied to something from thousands of years ago is an important cultural moment that we should be paying attention to. Uh, but I've always believed that, you know, whether I'm attending mass, I lived in Zambia when I when I studied abroad in college, whether I've been attending mass in Zambia, or I went to the yeah. Easter vigil one year in Germany at a candlelight vigil, I try to go to mass in every country that I visit, whether I'm in Israel at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, whatever that looks like, yeah. every culture has a little bit of a different spin on mass because of how they engage with mass in their culture. Uh, but it's about the Eucharist. That's what it's really all about. And whether you're in a field or a mountain somewhere, which I've experienced mass outside yeah. or on a battlefield or in a church on the other side of the world. It's really about that quintessential moment of the liturgy of the Eucharist. Absolutely. Now I want to know, especially with your experience now with RCIA, there's an interesting balance, I think, when it comes to evangelization. So going back to the evangelizing Gen Z. Yeah. In evangelization, I think a lot of times you have this balance between we want to present people with the truth but we also don't want to offend them and come yes. on too strong as you know currently right now i'm sure there's the whole crisis king thing i think is a good example of yeah. this 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 debate about like is it offensive to say that to people who are non-believers or to jews or muslims um and i've seen it in our own rcia program where it's like it, we had this we had this mix right of protestants that were there some were offended that we as catholics believed that we had the fullness of the truth Right. Interesting. And students so then, in class. So correct. Yeah. Like certain Protestants that were, were there. And it's just like we say, you know, we're talking about salvation or we're talking about whatever. There's no salvation outside the church. You know, that classic phrase that we have in Catholic teaching. And it's like, OK, we say all these things and they think about their parents or their families mm -hmm. or especially devout Christians that they know yeah. that are Protestant. And some of these things like to just say that they're wrong or even some of their beliefs are heretical which would be the true thing to say, right, can be offensive to them, understandably so. On the other side, when we start to swing the pendulum back in the other direction, then we had a guy at our, you know, in, at our RCIA program that said one day, like, well, like, yeah, I don't disagree with any of this stuff, but I don't like what's it doesn't really matter. Like, what's the difference? Mm. You know, like, I don't really need to be Catholic. And so I, I find that there's this tough balance for anybody teaching RCIA or doing formation in general, but especially when you're talking about talking to Protestants and Catholics, yeah. a world in which, you know, you occupy is mostly Protestant is like, how do we have this balance of saying like, you do need to be Catholic, mm. you know? Um, but we're not saying necessarily that you're damned if you don't yeah. become Catholic. Yeah. But I think if you believe what you believe about the Eucharist, and believe that John 6, he's talking about the Eucharist. Like Jesus says, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no life within you. Like that's not small. No. You know, the only not. way that you could say that that kind of would be optional is if you don't believe the Eucharist is the Eucharist. But you can't say that the Eucharist is the Eucharist and that Jesus says you need it for eternal life and be like, oh, no, like Catholic, it's all the same. Yeah. You know, we all believe the same thing. Oof. Okay. I want to start with addressing non-Christians first, because I think this sure. is interesting. Um, there's a church that's very, very influential in the Protestant world, big mega church in North Carolina called Elevation Church. I don't know if you're very familiar oh, with them, sure. but they went- I lived in Fayetteville when I was, there a, you go. When I was at Bragg. So you it's probably delicious. are very familiar with all of that, uh, yes. but they went incredibly viral this week because their director of social media and digital that's content awesome. said on a podcast, when we are inviting people to church, that's the most important thing for Easter this year is inviting people to church. When we are inviting them, we are going to go out of our way to avoid using the words Calvary, resurrection, blood of Jesus, et cetera, because we don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable when we invite them to Easter. And the most important thing is that we are inviting as many people as possible. I took a lot of issue with that. Uh, a, I love that we're inviting as many people as possible to Easter or any other Sunday, because that's a beautiful thing to be evangelizing and yep. bringing people into the beauty of our faith. But 
literally our entire faith hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. Like that yeah. is, that's the thing. That's the one thing <laughs> that like actually really matters here. And so it's weird to me that for so long in American culture, I dive into this a bit in my book, but I think Christianity has been so normal in American culture for so long, particularly from when our grandparents were growing up all the way up until now. Everybody went to church on Sunday. Everybody went and watched the football game after church on Sunday and ate chicken, and it was great, and that was very normal. That was the quintessential American picture of what life looked like, especially in certain parts of the country, that because it became so normal, we became really half in, half out, and it tied into secular culture, mm -hmm. what being a Christian meant. And now, because it's been so secularized, because it's been normalized and mainstreamed, there are so many, namely Protestant, but even Catholic churches that have been going out of their way, I've noticed more than ever in the last five years, to Americanize Christianity and to secularize their faith and their church, yep. to open the umbrella to bring as many people in as possible, and then watering down the essence of our faith. And it really bothers me that this is happening. There was another church with a female pastor. I think it was a Lutheran church. I did a reaction to maybe two, three months ago that really broke the internet. It got like 20 million views of a female pastor saying, yeah, the reason that we didn't read this part from the letter from Paul to so-and-so is because it's yikes. And we don't <laughs> think that that part of his letter really fits in with modern culture and society anymore. So we're just not going to read it. This is happening it doesn't match the vibe. every weekend at churches all across America, whether you're just omitting very important parts of your faith or going out of your way to like remarket and repackage them to make them more appealing to yeah. people. It's wrong. It's wrong to do that. And we do that in the church. We absolutely yeah, do that. I don't in the know. Uh, yeah. How much, how many people know this, but there's like the mass of the ages episode two really hits on this and I'm not, we don't go to TLM, but I like it. Sometimes I go uh, to daily mass. Um, but there's the brackets. So if you're ever looking in the, you know, in the book, like you're reading, reading the readings, there's always the bracketed parts. And if you pay attention to the bracketed parts, they're usually the hard parts. Yep. And so we like make those optional. And then you have a lot of parishes. You can kind of tell the vibe of the parish by whether or not they oh, read the brackets. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can tell <laughs> you know? the vibe very, very early on. Yeah. So we're doing this on purpose, maybe out of a, a beautiful intention and yeah, a like positive a intention answer. of wanting more people to come. But regardless of intention, the outcome is disastrous because truly it's changing the nature of our faith every single day. I mean, it's changing the truth of our faith every single day. And that's really concerning to me, even if it is a positive intention. So I have a problem with that fundamentally. And really, yeah. it's not what people want. As I just mentioned, Gen Z especially is seeking tradition. We're seeking structure. We're seeking something that is immovable by our constantly moving and changing culture. So we're already turned off by the beige cultural half in half out watered yep. down Christianity and it's not working as for inside of the faith with Protestants and Catholics, you know, I think for so long, especially in the political world that I've worked in, if you were Catholic, you just shut up about it. Nobody ever wanted to say anything about it because you would lose a lot of support. You would lose donors for your company. You would lose followers on social media. You would lose all credibility to give speeches at mega churches or, or different Christian conferences. And that's people's livelihood. So understandably, that's difficult to talk about. And when it comes to this, my faith is better than your faith thing. I don't know about you, Nathan, but I've just noticed kind of an onslaught of persecution and hatred against the Catholic Church more in the mm -hmm. last three, four years, maybe even more recent than that, than I ever witnessed growing up. Growing up, yeah. all of my friends were Protestant Christians. We had no problems with that. We asked yeah. them about church. They asked me about church. It was great. We sang the same songs at youth group. It was awesome. Like that was yes. it. Out of kind of nowhere. And maybe it's just because I'm so plugged into the political world where everybody has opinions about everything. So yeah. I might be the outlier. I'm looking at tweets saying that free will is a pagan myth and you shouldn't believe in that as a Christian. And if you do, especially those darn Catholics, you're going to hell. That Catholicism is a manifestation of pagan religions and doesn't worship God as the one true God and wow. you're going to hell. That if you have any sort of admiration or veneration of Mary, you are going to hell. Like this constant, you are damned, your salvation is just like gone poof, immediately vaporized into non-existence. And you're a bad person if you try to tell other people about your faith has just popped up out of nowhere. Yeah. And it's really concerning to me because as you said, that you're not damned if you do, you're not damned if you don't situation, 
the Catholic Church, so beautifully, has never, ever issued a statement on who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Because the truth is, we don't know. We have no idea. I mean, we would like to believe that we know, and we think from Scripture, this is what it says, so we would like to believe that's objectively the truth. But we have no idea. And I think it's sad to me that there is such a deep-seated love inside of the Catholic community in America for our Protestant brothers and sisters, but that's not really being reciprocated, at least from what I'm seeing in modern culture. So I've been doing a whole lot of work to try to unify the body of Christ again, to facilitate yeah. really important conversations. And just to be honest about the beautiful parts of Catholicism, a lot of people have been shying away from. There's a Father Mike speech that he gave several years ago at a Sikh conference about John chapter six. I'm sure every one of your followers has already seen it because it has like 30 million views. It's called The Hour That Will Change Your Life. Oh yeah, I was there. Oh, jealous, yep. jealous. I have watched this video probably 35 times and I've sent it to every person that I know. Yep. Because it's so transformative that when you hear this, the fullness of our faith, yeah. the intimacy of the Eucharist that you can't get in any other denomination, it's impossible to ignore that. And I think there are a million other examples in Catholicism of beautiful things like that, that we should be sharing with people. We shouldn't be afraid to share them with people. It's okay that people might be offended and turned off by that, but that do doesn't change your love of it and your passion for it and your ability to share it with others. For sure. And yeah, even maybe your duty to share it with other your people. Your obligation and responsibility to. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I've had this just kind of like regeneration in my spiritual life in like the last six months. Lent's been really good as well. But I think the, the book we were talking about before, this introduction to devout life. So a lot of my uh, listeners have just gone through that book together. And I think when you go through that, or like I'm reading Father Elijah, I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. heard of that. Have you read it before? No, but it's okay. on my list. I have yeah, it literally think, sitting on my bookshelf. I was going to say, I think you would really, really like it. Um, but it also has just like been a renewal for me, just reading his life and just the way he deals with persecution yeah. and hatred and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's what we've missed, right? We, we've kind of gotten away from that as Catholics, especially because we, we've bracketed the hard parts. Like when you do bracket the hard parts where Jesus is talking about carrying your cross and dying and the, the difficulties of the Christian life, then I think you do, you know, err on the side of, well, let's just do the easier thing. And a lot of times the the more comfortable or the politically correct thing can be the easier path, yeah. right? To just saying, I'm not going to offend anyone. And we don't have to be offensive in saying it, but saying what the church teaches in a bold and direct way, I think is the pathway forward. Because I think you see so many, especially we talked about, you know, in the red pill movement, the Andrew Tate's of the world. But I even think of like a Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. who's willing to just like say what he believes and not always have disclaimers. Yeah, and it's just like everything is a Catholic. Like you just, I get so much stuff, you know, about like, well, you didn't cap make this caveat and you didn't make this disclaimer. You didn't clarify this. And it's like, mm -hmm. you got to use some common sense here. But we can't say anything without people being offended. And I think there has to be just part of us that's willing to offend, but trying to do so still with love. Because I think the other extreme mm -hmm. that we have is, um, you know, we have the Catholics that start to get, you know, really hardened hearts towards the Protestants yeah. that are like that. Yeah. And they want to, you know, separate ourselves from them and, and kind of give them the full arm distance as well, which I don't think is the solution. I think people have to be very cautious to me. Like Twitter is just the worst. Like, I think you have people just at their absolute. Twitter is where dreams go to die. And I will always call it Twitter. I'm sorry. I know we're dead naming, but I cannot call it X. It's, I will never get it. But it's just the worst. And you can't like, you can't take that as like an actual gauge for society. Now it's you're going to have people that are rude yeah. in person or whatever that say things like that. And that's okay. And I think you just have to be satisfied and confident. I think it just it helps you to test your belief, how much you really believe what you believe, you know, when, when somebody says that to you and they say that, mm. oh, you're going to hell for this. It's like, man, maybe I should just think about it and reflect on my life, reflect on my salvation, reflect on my heart mm -hmm. and be like, man, there's definitely things I do in my life that could send me to hell. Yeah. I don't think this is one of them. That but... humility is so important. Yeah. And honestly, I think we all could use a big dose of it a lot. For sure. Um, we just did a retreat for my fiance's RCIA a couple of weekends ago. And a lot of it was just based in silent reflection and time and adoration. And the humility angle just kept coming back to me over and over and over again. Like, you can achieve so much in our secular culture and it's always about achievement. It's always about your resume. It's always about hitting this benchmark and getting this thing done yep. and constantly gaining more appreciation and adoration from other people. But ultimately all of that goes away at some point, right? Like this podcast could go away tomorrow. Our families could go away yeah. tomorrow. Like the most important the thing. The tech family could go away right the now. <laughs> they could go away right now. It's been a the only thing you really have is your relationship with Christ. And when yeah. you really hold on to that and you understand that's the only thing of permanence in your life, it's so, so, so beautiful. Yeah.
It's amazing. Well, I think, you know, I was reflecting on that too. It was interesting as you were talking about um, just the more, we just want to grow and we just want to have, you know, all these achievements and things like that. And you talked about earlier how a lot of times when you say you're Catholic, like you lose followers, you lose support. Oh, my. oh yeah. But it's been crazy since you, you know, in my journey with Isabel two years ago, said that you were Catholic and started being really outspoken about it. It feels like you've blown up even more than ever before. You know, I get asked about what the secret sauce it's is different. all the time. And I get so uncomfortable when people ask sure. me this because the truth is. I don't really care if there were five people there or five yeah. million people there. That's really not what it's about. I just try to post stuff that's the truth on social media and whatever people want to do with that, that's up to them. Um, but I've been asked behind the scenes and on other people's podcasts probably well, sure. like 200 times in the last few months. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you, like, we need to figure out what you're doing. And my fiance will tell you this. He runs social media for a living for other people yeah. at home. We sit there and we look at the algorithm and we look at the analytics and we're like, what is going on? I mean, there's yeah. no logical explanation for what has happened. And I could not give you the secret sauce in any way, shape yeah. or form, but truly it's all God. And I think a lot of that yeah, it's has been submission to just be honest about what you believe, be yeah. totally transparent and authentic with the world and what you think God can turn something into think even bigger than that because he right. will create opportunities for you that were never possible. Exactly. And I think a lot of people need to hear that and need to see that. But that's why I wanted to point that out that I think that it's really cool to me that I mean, you already had a big following back then. But you know, one, it just like un multiplied, you know, so, uh, just unbelievable amounts. And I think it's really cool that one that it kind of happened in that timeline. But then two, I think I just wanted to really applaud you that I think you. you have a humble spirit to you. I think there's a lot of people that you meet. I mean, I always I always talk about this with meeting Catholic speakers, ones who have much, much more followers, <laughs> but deem themselves very, very important. And there's many who don't. I always say Father Mike is the best. Like, I think he is. Like, He's amazing. I met him at the March for Life like, two years dude. ago, maybe. I just walked up to him and I said, I, I love your podcast. It's nice to meet you. And he shook my hand. He's like, it's nice to meet you too. And then we kept talking. It was the easiest thing, but he's great. I That's really awesome. Love him. Yeah, he's so good. But I think you have you have a very similar spirit. And, and I think you do a good job of remaining humble and just being who you are. Thank you. You know, in the midst of all of it. Because we were just talking about that before. Of just like, Emily was like, is she in my class? And I was like, no, I think she's like two years younger than you. I graduated You're from high school in 2015. And then college in 2019. So you guys were actually the same mm -hmm. class. I think, I think she's a year yeah. older than you um birthday wise yeah. but yeah but that's so that's so funny but we were just talking about that about how crazy it is and yeah we think you handle it really well so thank you it has yeah. definitely been kind of a weird journey facing a whole lot of backlash this year obviously i'm no stranger to backlash i get called all kinds of oh, horrible really names and you should read my dms and it's ugly it's always been really ugly but like inside of the people you thought were on your own team i think it's a different feeling to have other creators or like people with their own platforms say just the most out of pocket ridiculous things even yeah. when you've been friends or friendly in the past that's kind of hard to wrap your head around and i think is a big turnoff for a lot of people um for example there was this podcast interview i won't go into specifics but in the conservative world a couple of months ago and there was a trailer posted on instagram that like a thousand people tagged me in because in this trailer they say that catholicism is a false religion and everybody going to Catholic mass on Sunday is going to hell and we have to do our best to like identify that publicly and da, 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 da. so much wow. people start tagging me in the comment <laughs> section of this video asking me to respond. I didn't because it was a little too sensitive, but I saw a comment in the comment section from Michael Knowles and he quoted Fulton Sheen and he said, there's nobody in America who actually hates the Catholic church, but there are millions of people who hate what they think the Catholic church is. And that totally struck a chord with me about yeah. six months ago that it's okay if people hate what I'm saying. It's okay if people have a lot of backlash for it. But if I can create an opportunity to pull the veil back a little bit and just tell people the truth about our faith instead of what they think about our faith, it's a really cool opportunity to bring back some more church unity, which we really need. Yeah, it is. And it's so special too, I think, again, going back to like the timeline of your journey where like you've grown in your influence as you've you know gone deeper into your faith. I've always had that prayer for myself and maybe that's why my podcast isn't that big. It might be a reflection of my spiritual growth. But I oh, always gosh, say, like, no. <laughs> was like, don't let me grow. But seriously, like, don't let me get bigger than, like, I'm capable of yeah. handling ever. Yeah. You know, like, I'd rather, again, like, I'd rather talk to five people and just, like, go deep with them or just, like, lead a men's group and drop the podcast or whatever it is. You know, like, help out at a youth group, whatever. But don't let me, like, grow past a certain point where I can actually mm. handle and sustain it. Because there's just so many people, I think. In the Catholic world, obviously, we know that in the political world, it happens where people are very faithful and then they get the money, the fame, all that stuff, and, and they start to lose their way. All the time. 
Yes. Yeah, it's really, really hard. But yeah, just going back to, you know, just kind of the general, you know, church, Gen Z, as you've been more vocal, like, what do you kind of see as your role now, mm. you know, influencing the church? Or do, do you have like any, with the content that you create, and especially as you're going to get your master's now, like, is that going to be something that's going to be more of a part of the things that you're posting and talking about? Or is it more just so you can better answer the questions when, you know, you inevitably have these Protestant commentators DMing you, you know, yes, <laughs> in the shadows. Yes, the short answer to all of that. Yeah. I'm really excited about this master's program. It's part-time, so it definitely is doable with all of my career. But uh, the whole point is you're supposed to not be working in a position of church leadership. You're supposed to be outside of the church in this master's program. Nice. And they're using this as a way to cultivate Catholic leaders out in the world and be beautiful and, and honest about what the Catholic church is to people in the secular world. And I think that's really cool because there's not a lot of programs like that. I think most, yeah. especially higher academic programs at a master's or PhD level are about consolidating inside the church rather than spreading out. And I think it's just a really yes. cool structure that way. I've already been um, integrating a whole lot of faith related content much more frequently into what For I've sure. been posting. Yeah. And that was a big big shift about two years ago now, right about the time I did your podcast then, yeah. that I really was exhausted talking about politics all the time. I love politics. I worked in the White House. I would love to go back and work in the White House someday. Like I can talk about this bill and this speech from the president and this press conference all day long. I'm the children of lawyers. So it's my, my siblings and I are the children of lawyers. So we can talk about politics all the time. But I've realized that there's no appetite for that in the larger cultural space right yeah. now because everything is political. I mean, down to the brand of underwear that you're wearing right now, especially if it's Calvin Klein, you're making a partisan political statement. Right. The toothbrush that you used this morning is making a partisan political statement. And we're just so fatigued and exhausted and burnt out on everything hinging on partisan politics that as soon as you do talk about who's running for president or what this bill says or whatever, people just immediately tune you out. They want nothing to do with it. They will scroll right past. And so I saw an opportunity about two years ago to think bigger than that and start talking a whole lot more about culture rather than politics. Um, it was the late great Andrew Breitbart that said politics is always downstream from culture. And if you mm -hmm. want to change what's happening in the halls of Congress or the Oval Office or your state legislature, you have to first start with changing how people live their day to day lives, things like their relationships and the food that they eat and how they go to work and their faith and all of the things that they do outside of how they vote that will impact how they vote and who they get to vote for later on. So I kind of looked around about two years ago and I noticed in the conservative movement, conservative ink, whatever you want to call it. There really was no top of funnel content to go reach people that weren't already in that yeah. bubble. I called it like the cylinder. Everybody had the same show with the same topics, with the same guests on the same day. And it just kind of kept rotating around and around and around. Yeah. But we weren't capturing anybody new. And so I really thought, okay, what can I talk about that has this conservative with a lowercase c, not really political, lens that can change how people live their day-to-day -day lives and try to bring people along in that movement to eventually send them to those shows that everybody does every day. I can talk about dating. I can talk about agriculture. I can talk about church on Sunday. I can talk about this crazy viral TikTok trend or the movie or TV show that everybody's talking about. And that really was a seismic shift in my career in terms of how quickly all of the platforms started growing and, and how well the live stream was doing. And uh, in the last six months or so, I've really been weaving in a whole lot more religious content. I've had several reaction videos to crazy woke pastors get like 10, 20 million views on social media, which has been yeah. crazy with really positive response from people. Of, this is insane. We shouldn't be allowing stuff like this. We need to be speaking up about it. And so I'm seeing from across the entire Christian space right now, regardless of your denomination, there is such a hunger of being proud of your faith of being unashamed yeah. to be outspoken about the things that we believe in, of seeking tradition. And absolutely, I'm going to be weaving all of that and more into all of my content moving forward. That's really cool. Yeah, because it kind of feels like, I feel like Alex Clark did that really well with politics for a while. And now she's really shifted, I feel like, into like the crunchy realm. Like Emily just loves all of <laughs> And I just always laugh at like her and like Jordan Lee Dooley. Like, it just cost me so much money. They were just constantly all these. And we just so often are just like so heads in the clouds, you know, Socrates about it, where it was just like, we just want to talk about the theology, yeah. you know, transubstantiation. It's like, that's good. But how do we get there? If like my marriage is on the brink of divorce or if I'm, you know, super in debt and I just don't know how to get out of it and I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Like, how can we give people some of that practical stuff as well? Yeah. And some of that guidance. And I don't even think it's mutually exclusive, right? I think you can do... No 
the cool academic head in the clouds theology conversations right alongside day to day life. I mean, really, what was so right. transformative for my fiance and I in finding Catholic community were our best friends in Phoenix who are both Catholic. Um, and we would go out for double dates, you know, every single weekend and we'd just hang out talk about <laughs> our work week. And then all of a sudden, inevitably we'd be like, okay, but Mary and the Eucharist, yeah. and it would get this like really, really cool theology conversation going every single time thinking larger than our world and larger than my day-to-day -day problems. But you can't get there unless you solve those day-to-day -day problems too. And so I think they can't be mutually exclusive. They have to work hand in hand and we have to be able as a church to reach out a hand to those who are struggling in their marriages and their finances and the economy and all of these things that do matter and impact our day-to-day -day lives right. so that we can facilitate those nerdy academic conversations yeah. too. Which is the importance of what you talked about with the master's program, because I think a lot of times with, you know, you maybe think about Franciscan, Benedictine, and Ave, like the, you know, really, really strong Catholic schools, Christendom, Thomas Aquinas College, when you were talking way back in the beginning of your experience at CSU with the Catholics there, of just the shame about like, well, you don't do all like, not everything in your life is about Catholicism and daily mass and all that stuff. And it's like, yes, a lot of people devalue or underprioritize their faith life. But there has to be, and this is why I think it's so important for us to have some type of ideals or standards mm -hmm. that we shoot for. Because if not, then it's easy to become very, very scrupulous and just say, I constantly, I always have to do more than I'm currently yeah. doing. Or it's very easy. It's also, on the other hand, easy to be like, well, I'm doing enough when I'm doing nothing. Right. If we have no idea of like, what should we be striving for? But it's like, okay, if I'm praying 30 minutes a day, I'm going to mass on Sundays and I try to make the daily mass when I can. And, or I'm in Bible study or whatever it is, you know, like something other supplementing, then it's like, that's good enough, you know, and that might be good for my season that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. But I think the other issue that a lot of those schools have is exactly this, where they train people, especially the theology majors, where it's like, oh, we're going to go be youth ministers and we're just going to focus yep. on the church and we're just going to constantly be faith stuff. And then their lives. And I've heard this from a lot of people. I know some people now that work with people who get themselves into difficult situations in those career fields where their marriages are off track or they realize I have guys that reach out to me all the time, especially working at Hallow, but just kind of in general guys that'll reach out and be like, Hey man, like I was a focused missionary or I was a youth minister and now I'm getting married or my wife's pregnant and, and she wants to stay home. Like, what do I do? Yep. And I'm like, it's kind of late. This is not impossible. You know, like you're only 27 or whatever. Like it's not, your life's not over, but like, this is not the best time to have been thinking about that. You know, like it's basically, if you think of the farming analogy, right? Like they go out and they're just like, I, I need to harvest in two weeks. And it's like, brother, you should have been planting. Back in the fall. You know, planting My in brother spring. in Christ, what are you doing? Yeah, this is not the time to get the seeds out. You know, like you got to give it some time. You got to yeah. work the ground. But um, yeah, it, so it's beautiful to to hear that. And I think it's going to be really good to see your influence in that realm. And I'm excited to hear about the things that you're learning about in your master's program. That's going to be great. Me too. The classes seem so interesting. Yeah. So I'm really, really excited about it. And the faculty is incredible. Um, but I think it's also so important that we don't do the same thing the political world has done in the church and create that cylinder where it's the same people watching the same shows, having the yes. same guests, talking about the same topics. Like what I love about the structure of this program is it is intended to go be that funnel, like go talk yeah. in the secular world about your faith. We do do that exact same thing. We do that thing. all the time. And you're like seen almost and elevated as a better Catholic, so to speak. Yeah. If your entire life is about your parish community and being a focused missionary and going to all the conferences and leading RCIA yeah. and doing youth group and teaching Sunday school and leading vacation Bible school. I mean, everything like has to be at your parish. And then all of a sudden you're a really bad Catholic if you try to go yeah. out into the world and do that. But think about some of the most impactful and influential saints in history. It's mm -hmm. been people willing to go where nobody else wanted to go yeah. and have these conversations in the heart of culture and try to change it from the inside out. So I'm very, very excited. About Absolutely. It. Well, I love that. And, and I know, you know, you said about how you've kind of had the shift from politics into culture, but you still are around some really negative things Ugh, in that world, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're ways deep in the, the ugliest things that are happening in our world. And so I'm curious, you know, what role your faith plays in you maintaining positivity, but also just like in your day to day life? Because um, there's a lot of people I think that this can extend into other things, right? Even if you're not immersed in culture and politics. I know I, I like to take a step back from some of that stuff sometimes, but even people who have a really negative boss or they have really negative spouse or they have yep. like, how do you, when you have, 
you know, for you, that's kind of your forced negativity, right? Because of your job and what you do for, for a living <laughs> is you have to be immersed in this just ugliness and the harsh reality of, of human nature. Um, how do you maintain a positive outlook? And I think the book, you know, coming back to the book as well, I think it had a very optimistic outlook for the future. Yeah. And so how did, how do you, how did you get to that point where you feel optimistic about the future, but also just kind of day to day, how do you not get overwhelmed by the negativity? You know, it's funny you use that word optimistic because several times in the last week I've been in Fox news studios or Newsmax or whatever. And the anchors on TV who are a lot older than us will look at me and say, well, this feels too optimistic. This isn't realistic. Really? This isn't, da, da, da. let's just bring us back down to earth a little bit here about what you think is possible. And that's so fascinating to me because yeah, I, I'm very optimistic. I think if you read this book, it's incredibly obvious that I'm very optimistic, yeah. even in what feels like the most broken and divided time in modern history, where most people are like, I'm just throwing in the towel. I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to be fighting. And you, you do offense. paint that realistic. I, you know, I think you do a good job each chapter, basically you're painting, you're pointing out different problems and different issues and kind of really analyzing the battlefield of the situation for what it is. I don't think that you gloss it over or minimize and say, Oh, it's not as bad as people think. Yeah. You know, you're like, dude, it's a mess no, out it's there. An absolute you terrible. go through it all feminism. Yeah. And then you're like, but I think we can still fix it. Yeah, I do. I, and I think that because we've been in worse situations before, in human history we've been in the darkest darkest chapters of human history and we've still somehow found our way back from the brink of that and i think all of that is because of god and, and the greater plan how do i stay optimistic in my day-to-day -day life um you know it's the easiest thing in the world to feel overwhelmed and anxious and hyperventilating about the future of america when every single day i have to talk about abortion i have to talk about dylan mulvaney's latest music video i have to talk about <laughs> child gender transition and all of the crap that's happening there. It is so easy every day as I'm scrolling to find stories to talk about or, or to react to, to just look up and be like, what am I doing? What are, what is humanity doing? How do we even go yeah. forward from here? Because every day it seems to be getting a little bit crazier and a little bit crazier mm -hmm. and a little bit crazier. The irony is my book is called the end of the alphabet, how Gen Z can save America. At the end of the book, I basically say, People can't save America. Like we, no generation can, no individual person can. I'm kind of tired of the conservative movement, conservative Inc. politics saying, we're going to save the country. We're going to save the world. We're going to do all this. So give us all your money and we're going to do it because we're going to save it. Because the truth is we can't. Like genuinely humanity cannot save humanity. We believe that as Christians, but we don't always put that into action in the secular world, especially in the political world. Mm -hmm. The really big dichotomy and juxtaposition of all of this crazy stuff that we talk about, and frankly, it's ironic, is we believe that humanity is going to get crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier, and our situation is going to get worse yep. and worse and worse and worse and worse until Jesus comes back, and then it's going to get better. And so I kind of have a different perspective on this than a lot of people. Yes, I think there is hope to save, so to speak, Western civilization and the United States of America because of the pendulum swing with our generation happening right now. And we should be feeding into that and encouraging that and platforming yeah. that in any way that we can. But ultimately, America will fall apart. Every country in the world will fall apart. And I think yeah. it's hard to grasp that because we don't want to think about the apocalypse. We don't want to think yeah. about the end of the world. We don't want to think about our own demise as humanity, but we believe that that's going to happen. If you can divorce your political perspective and your religious perspective there for a second, ultimately the salvation of the world is way more important than trying to save America or who's sitting in the Oval yep. Office or what bill they're talking about in Congress. And the only way that you will die. You will so die you will and your own salvation <laughs> is in question. And we don't like to think about that because it keeps us up at night. Right. A huge, this is a total tangent, but I had a huge deep conversation with my fiance a couple of days ago when we were talking about, everybody's been asking, do Jews, Muslims, and Christians all worship the God of Abraham? And there's been this huge oh, yeah. debate so happening on social media about it. So tied in with the crisis King stuff. Yes, we were talking about this till like two, three in the morning and literally all night I just laid there looking at the ceiling and I'm like, I'm going to die someday. <laughs> salvation is in question and we don't like it's to think about that idea. but it's true um that's so much more important and it's okay i think to let go a little bit of the constant need to control our spiral into demise in the yeah. secular political world because it's going to happen like that's okay it's okay to just let that go and let go and let god so to speak cute little catchphrase there but yeah we need to do that because ultimately that's going to happen for the entire world but when it does he'll come back 
And that gives us an opportunity for salvation there. So I think about it from the perspective of, yeah, it's really bad out there. Yeah, it's getting a whole lot worse every single day. Like truly, excuse my language here, but the only way to describe what's going on in the world is a total shit show. And it's getting way, way, way worse every single day. But that gives me a lot of hope and optimism because that means we're one day closer to Jesus coming back. That's right. I love it. I thought one of your hottest takes in the book was talking about um, how people over romanticize the past, Mm. you know, especially in the conservative world. I think that that's something that I've seen a lot of times. And Emily and I were talking about it. So I was like, yeah, I thought this point was so good because I don't I don't hear a lot of people talking about that. Because for me, I would say just as a black dude. It's like, I don't want to go back into the past yeah. and, and, you know, and say like, oh, the, the 40s were so good. And it's like, were they? It depends on what part of the country you're looking at, you know, or what, what statistics you're analyzing. Sure, there were some better things back then. There's no denying that. But and, and I think even black culture was in a better spot back then, for mm-hmm. sure. But does that mean that we haven't made some progress? Does that mean that we can't paint a better future that's not just trying to get back to our past? I had somebody yeah. who used to challenge me to this all the time spiritually, is I would always look at my spiritual life when I was in my early 20s, and I'd be like, I just want to get back to where I was in college. And he'd be like, no, like God has a better, like he wants to take you beyond that. You know, he wants to get you back there. Sure. But beyond that, that is not just like your ceiling It's not just what you once were in the past. And that's something that I think is even true for us Catholics is a lot of times Catholics in the TLM movement want to say like, well, let's go back. We need to yeah. go back to 1962 and like just restore everything. It's like maybe like we could definitely improve a mm-hmm. lot of the liturgies around the world. There's no doubt, and especially here in the U.S. There's some ugly and terrible stuff that's happening. And it's no surprise to me that a lot of people don't believe in the Eucharist based on the liturgy they're seeing on Sunday. But at the same time, I don't know if you're doing the Pray 40 Challenge. I know you so good advertising. Love it. No, it's around. been so good. I love Pray 40. I, it was boof. The first how ad that I saw from it was about so pumped. It was a little assist. Uh, Total side note, I was in New York City last week for my book launch, and I went to St. Patrick's because I love St. Patrick's. You can't go to yeah. New York and not go to St. Patrick's Cathedral. And right in the intro walk-in area to St. Patrick's is a big hello banner, and I took a picture with it because I was like, yes, those are my people. <laughs> I love it. We're glad to have you on the team. Yep, yep. It's awesome. And, but Sister Bernice, you know, one of her, uh, I think it was a few Saturdays ago, but she talked about, you know, her experience of like wanting to join a religious order. She felt like God was calling her to be a nun. And she was like, they said, you need to go back to your own kind. And I didn't know what that meant back then. But, you know, she's hinting and insinuating that like we weren't allowed to do certain things. Yeah. The church, there's a lot of Catholic priests 60 years ago that wouldn't have married Emily and I. Yep. And it's like, is that what you want me to go back to? Yeah. Why can't we just paint a better future? And, re- mm. you know, doesn't mean that we can't reform a lot of the things that we need, but we still have to continue to move forward and, and really work towards this better future that's possible. What I love the most about our generation is we love and romanticize sometimes the past with traditional values and the ideas that have been timeless. I think timeless is a great word in addition to traditional because it doesn't insinuate always backwards. It's outside of time, right? Yeah. It always perseveres like marriage and the family and, and a beautiful actual education instead of indoctrination that we receive right now sure. in the American education system. And when you look at all of these ideas, it doesn't insinuate that you have to go backwards. It doesn't have to look like the white picket fence of the 1950s. It doesn't have to look like the traditional housewife and the man leaving and going to his job yeah. and then coming back. You know, we're putting kind of our own unique futuristic generational spin on those ideas. Great example in COVID, uh, when everybody was remote, right? Our like little American dream as Gen Zers was to have a remote job, which everybody had, and to go do van life throughout all of the national <laughs> yeah. parks in the West or to travel all over the world and work from your hotel room for a few hours and then go experience new cultures and meet new people. What a cool lifestyle. And that never would have been possible 50 or 60 or 70 years right, ago. Yeah. But now is very mainstream. I hear stories like this all the time. People full-time RVing or living in their van or they bounce around from house to house to house or Airbnbs because they want to experience so many different places and, and meet people and try new foods and experience new cultures while still having a job at their nine to five and all of that. And yeah. I, I think that's so fascinating because it still prioritizes family and marriage and relationships, yeah. but it also has this new age spin on adventure and immersion in other people's ways of life and that shared humanity that I think we've forgotten a whole lot about. It's still the American dream. It might not look like a white picket fence. It's just a new generational version of that. So I, I like the word timeless over traditional with a lot of these conservative with the lowercase c values that we're talking about. 
uh, because it doesn't always insinuate going backwards. The truth is we can't go backwards. Never in humanity have we ever gone backwards. No. It's impossible. You can't put the internet back we in the box. have to go forwards. And you especially know? with the internet technology, yeah. artificial intelligence, it social media. It just too much. It's our, the, the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So I know, you know, 20, you were, from my understanding, MAGA hat wearing all four. Oh, yeah. Years. Oh, yeah. 2020. Obviously, I think we all were. We really bought in. We uh, had experienced it and things were good. We knew that Biden was going to be a train wreck. And so now I want to know two things as we close is one, what is your kind of feelings about Trump going into the election this year in 2024? And then if you'd be willing to make a prediction of what you think will happen. Oh my God. I've no made so many predictions over the last year or so. Sure. Uh, my biggest prediction still stands true. I don't think Joe Biden will be the nominee for the Democratic really? Party for a million different reasons, but the man can't remember his own name. I mean, it, there's just so much going on there in terms of cognitive yeah. decline. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was removed via the 26th Amendment being unfit to be president or mm -hmm. the DNC actually has different rules than the RNC at their convention. You don't have to have won all of the primaries to be the presumptive nominee for the party. I don't wow. know if you remember in 2016, Bernie Sanders was like sounding the alarm that he was winning all these primaries and then they cheated him out of the yeah, election yeah, yeah. at the I do DNC. They replaced him with Hillary Clinton. <laughs> The exact same thing probably is going to happen here. I've been saying that at the convention, they probably were going to replace him with Michelle Obama. And there's a lot of whistleblowers who have come forward saying Michelle Obama is running for president. She's having all of these fundraisers. She's doing all this stuff behind the scenes. Wow. But then her team about two weeks ago put out a statement saying, I am definitively not that's running for yeah, president. That's what I thought I'd seen. So it's possible. I don't know. I still think that could be a, I don't want to do it, but I'll do it for the good of the country yeah. thing going on with the Obamas. Gavin Newsom really wouldn't surprise me as the nominee for the Democrat Party. Yeah. They're having him do a whole lot rolling out the red carpet for him. It would be my guess, but. But we'll see. I don't know. Um, that's still my biggest prediction. If it is, in fact, Joe Biden, I actually think Trump now has a fighting chance to beat him. I wouldn't have said that in the last several months. But between all of the stuff happening in the Middle East and, and the Democrat Party voters being really upset with that and the TikTok ban, where all of a sudden Joe Biden hates TikTok, even though it's benefiting him every day. So bizarre. Yeah. Young voters are just over Joe Biden, want nothing to do with him. The polling is very definitive on this. And for the first time in a long time, I think Trump could actually stand to, to beat Joe Biden in November. I love President Trump. I'm very clear about that. I have worked for him in the White House yeah. in 2018. I was on the cover of Newsweek magazine and a MAGA hat for him <laughs> in 2019 for the 2020 election. Um, I've been really frustrated this election cycle, and that's not a secret. I've been very open about that just because it kind of feels like Groundhog Day. And yes. our country is not dealing with the same problems that it was in 2020, and it certainly isn't dealing with the same problems that it was in 2016, but it kind of feels like the exact same election playbook is being used right. to get back into the White House that way. When Donald Trump came down the escalator in 2015, that was almost 10 years ago. I yes. mean, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like it was five minutes ago, yeah. but that was almost a decade ago. There are completely Lots different issues. Most people didn't know what BLM was. Correct. The, the concept story. of Antifa didn't exist at yep. the time. The gender theology movement, I say theology because it's like a religion for these people, was not at all even on anybody's radar at the time. I mean, we are in a totally different country than we were nine years ago. It's hard for me to just feel like I'm watching the same election resurrected yeah. over and over and over again. I have been a huge fan, repeatedly said this often, of Vivek Ramaswamy when he was running for president. Yeah. I think he brought a new energy, a new level of excitement, and really fresh new ideas that are demanded from our new world uh, to the Republican primary. I was able to spend a day with him on the Iowa campaign trail, which was incredibly eye-opening, and the man has nothing but my utmost respect. Obviously, he wasn't going to win yeah. the primary. He had like 20,000 followers when he first <laughs> ran for president, but... A lot of his ideas are getting adopted into mainstream political ideology now. Yeah. And that's really cool to see that one person can shake things up just that much. Um, and I think he set himself up really well to be a front runner in the future. So, of course, I will be voting for President Donald Trump in, in the fall. I don't know who the other nominee is going to be, but, you know, Dave Rubin is kind of famous <laughs> for saying right now, you don't have to be a Republican but you can't be a Democrat. So that's just where we're at right now. And uh, I'll be really curious to see if they do, in fact, replace Joe Biden or they try to stick it out. But I don't think it'll work well for them if they do. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think Trump does have a good chance if it is Biden, but we'll see what happens.
Amen to that. It's a crazy country. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This is great getting to talk with you in person. And I just want to say on behalf of at least the conservative Catholics that we're very proud to have you as one of our own and of all the work stuff. that you're doing. Thank you so it's much, awesome. Nathan. I've loved the work that you've done with Seeking Excellence and Hello, obviously. Uh, but I just want to give you a shout out too that you are doing so much, especially for young men and being so courageous and proud of their faith. We need so much more of that out there. And I hope sure. that this continues to encourage so many people to be loud and proud and outspoken about all the things we believe in. Amen. Well, I hope more, especially Catholics, will go check out the end of the alphabet. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah it's great. It's a great book. It's a great read. And I think you did a wonderful job with it. We're excited to see what else you do. Thank you so much.